You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 68, Website Investing and the Rhodium Community. Welcome back, everyone, to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and I've got a fun one for you today. Before we get started, just a quick update. New episodes of Liberty Entrepreneurs will be released twice per month now instead of every week to free up time for a new podcast on virtual assistants and my own personal journey as a digital entrepreneur while I travel the world for the next 12 months straight. More on this soon. All right. Today's show is all about community, and my guest, Chris Yates, has built an amazing one called Rhodium. There came a time in Chris's life where he decided that he wanted to build a small but highly connected conference for digital and online entrepreneurs to help them grow their businesses, network, and learn from each other. Longtime listeners will remember that I attended the Rhodium Weekend Conference, as it's called, back in 2016 and came away with a ton of insights and a wonderful new network of A players and entrepreneurs. Chris and I chat about his background and experience becoming a digital entrepreneur, as well as what this community means to him and what it's been like to see his event and community really take shape and act as such a resource to so many who attend. My favorite part of this interview is when Chris tells us why he has two main points that he really wants to get across in the conference and in the community. And those are speak from experience and always lead with value. So without further ado, thanks again for tuning in and let's get right into the show. Chris, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Hey, Ash, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Honored that you would uh, invite me on. So just a little background. I met Chris through a mutual friend and I attended his conference, the Rhodium Weekend Conference in October of 2016. And I know this sounds dramatic, but it literally changed my life. Uh, It gave me a perspective of digital entrepreneurship that I did not previously have. And I'm just really thankful for you coming on the show, Chris. If you don't mind, just give us a little bit of background of who you are and what you're passionate about. Sure. So a couple, I guess, in terms of when you ask me what I do in terms of work, what uh, my two main focus are right now, one is Rhodium Weekend, which involves a, an annual event and includes a uh, mastermind and a Facebook community and a podcast and a bunch of other stuff that, to, to help support the community that goes along with that event. And then two is um, currently own a company called Centurica, and we provide Uh, basically we're like a property inspector for people who are buying online businesses. So we go in and we do the due diligence to make sure that there's no surprises that a buyer might have uh, when they're buying, say, a website from somebody. And let's talk more about the whole buying and selling and investigating websites. When did you get started with that? Back in 2009. Uh, The story, I'll give you the brief version, feel free to ask me more, but the story was back in 2009, I owned a digital marketing agency. So my typical clients were kind of smaller companies, um, typically offline businesses who wanted to start going online and and improve their rankings in the search engines and and, uh, build their website and get their logo design and that kind of thing. And it was one of those things where I was, uh, I really felt chained to my desk uh, because I was on the phone managing client expectations all day and trying to get information I needed to complete the job for them and all this kind of stuff. And um, I had employees that had their own sort of headaches that went along with that who were sitting next to me and would show up late and various things. And, um, you know, it just wasn't really the life that I had envisioned for myself. And around this time, I'd also had our first child and it was kind of fortuitous. Around that time, I had a former employer called me up and he's like, hey, Chris, I am about to sell my company and I'm looking for the next thing to do. So, uh, he's like, um, let's put our heads together and maybe I, you know, we can put some money into something that doesn't take a lot of time. And so we kind of thought about it for a while, looked around a little bit and we're like, why don't we go buy some websites or some online businesses that are already established and kind of use our skills that we've developed over the years together in uh, digital marketing strategy and things like that 
to take them over and grow them and, and, you know, either hold them as a portfolio or turn around and sell them. And so we, in that first year or so, probably bought like 10 different websites. Um, the returns were phenomenal, really, really good returns. And I'm like, wait, this is way more fun than dealing with clients all day. So I ended up selling my marketing agency and got full time into um, buying these online businesses and operating them. And this was back in 2009? Yeah, our first official deal was was I believe I can't remember if it closed at the it was either the end of two thousand nine or for two thousand ten something like that. Just give us an idea. I know that buying and selling cash flowing websites is still pretty foreign to most people, even my audience. I think the first mindset is I'm going to build a website and I'm going to make it cash flow and I'm going to find this niche and I'm going to put in all this research and this effort. But you took a different approach. You found already proven ideas, website ideas, businesses that were cash flowing and you would jump in there and use the skill sets that you learned previously at your desk job and made these websites bigger and better and more profitable. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. And it's kind of, you know, I don't know, the, the simplest way I could put it is that we, we developed a constraint for ourselves, which is we didn't want to spend a lot of time. Um, and we knew that starting something from scratch takes massive amounts of time. And we, we had the, uh, the benefit, I suppose you would say, of having funds available to put into something. So you can either invest your time or you can invest your money or some combination of the two. And we were we were a little heavier on money than we were on time. And um, so it made way more sense for us just to buy something that's already established. And uh, I love just like, I have a mind for seeing kind of the hidden gems that are out there. And so it really lended itself well for that skill set where I could see potential in an acquisition and then realize that potential with the kind of the skill set that I have. So absolutely the the case and it fit really well kind of with the constraints that I had given that I was running a business already and my business partner was, you know, sitting in an earnout in uh in his company for X number of years. So it fit really, really well for both of us. Yeah. So let's get down into the nitty gritty of what you feel that your skill set is, Chris. I know some people it's marketing or systems or building, you know, what would you say is your core skill set? Honestly, that's a really tough one for me to answer. I mean, it seems weird, but, um, I've, and I've tried to answer that for myself. The, the challenge is, so I, I have a computer science degree, so I'm actually, uh, I'm able to write software, understand software, things like that. Um, and, but I've also been involved in online marketing and and business for for years. So I'm kind of like, I think of myself as the kind of person who can walk across multiple um, skill sets very easily. So this this may seem sound a little bit weird, but I I feel like my one of my strongest skill sets is the ability to see connections amongst various things. So for instance, how I can look at a analytics report and see that all of these numbers here are telling a story and I can understand what that story is. And then I can understand what it's going to take for me to, to change that story into a better story and actually make that story uh, happen and, and the steps that it's going to take one by one and the, be able to put the team together to make that, that actually happen. It sounds a little bit funny, but that's the simplest way I, I can kind of explain what my skill set is. It's like pattern identification and seeing where you want to go and being able to know or have a great idea of how you're going to get there. I, I, I really relate to that as someone with an engineering background and a computer science background as well. But I would say it seems like you're more of a quarterback or a manager or you can see value in different places and then get the wheels turning and start building that by maybe systems and delegating. Am I getting close? Honestly, not a great delegator, to tell you the truth. Um, what I've found is that I'm, uh, you know, given that I don't, I don't want to use the phrase jack of all trades, but I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. So th that's a blessing and a curse. But I, what I've realized over the years is that I really enjoy the creation process and I really enjoy working with team members, but they have to be like really smart people that can sort of, uh, that I can be pretty hands off with. And, um, I actually learned this from a book called quiet by a lady named Susan Kane. I'd always had this question in my mind about can an introvert or, or a person who has a personality, a, a normal personality type of being more introverted, can an introverted leading person 
also be a leader. And I struggled with that for years. And once I read that book, it made so much sense to me because she, the way she explains it is that an introverted, introverted type of person needs people. He can be, he or she can be a fantastic leader if they surround themselves with people who take initiative. And that will allow you to just sort of like, here's the end result I want. And they will go figure out how to make it happen. And you don't have to be there micromanaging and constantly getting feedback and all that kind of stuff, which is exhausting for an introvert. So, so <laughs> actually delegation is not my strong suit. What my strong suit is, is finding really good people to work with, connecting them, like giving and, and sort of being able to actually execute myself on a lot of things. Right. Yeah, it's like the phrase A players like to work with A players, not B or C players. Yeah, I, I would just add that I, I am a believer that people can be developed. And what I what I actually look at myself as is somebody who can see sort of um and I mentioned this with websites, but I do it with people as well, as I as I look for kind of the diamond in the rough and people as well who may not be considered quote unquote an A player because they don't have the experience, but there's something that I see in them that will help them get there. And some of my best team members have actually been people like that. Mm. So let's talk about the community. I know that you've built a very impressive community. It is highly connected and everyone is an online entrepreneur. And there's a lot of different online businesses that people are uh, building in this community. It's not just all Amazon affiliate sites, for instance. Could you just very quickly rattle off a couple of the main online uh, business types that people in the Rhodium community are currently building or uh, involved in? Sure. Yeah, we have a lot of people who do sites that are similar to what you might expect a blog to be. So basically just pure content sites and they make money using those, using advertising on those sites. And that advertising might be putting ads that Google provides, or that advertising might be getting a commission for sending people over to Amazon. So that'd be one example. Another would be people who provide um, software or software as a service types of solutions. And, you know, if you think about something like salesforce.com, where you literally use this software through your browser. Um, a lot of people are doing that in our community. Another one is e-commerce. I mean, basically people just selling products and there's lots of ways that they do that. Some people sell through Amazon. Some people have their supplier send their products directly to their customers for them. Others actually deal with the product and they, you know, create it and design it and, and uh, develop the whole supply chain and all that kind of stuff. So it really is all over the board, but at the end of the day, the commonality is that pretty much everybody in the community, I guess I would say that they are doing their transaction or the way that they make money happens through some kind of an online asset, a website, a mobile app, um, through Amazon or through Shopify or whatever. It all happens online. They're not like, for instance, going and going and knocking on doors to sell their products, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, it's it's amazing how many niches you can find in the online space and you know turn revenue from them. I know that you and Finzer, who you recently interviewed and who was the first interview that I had in the Rhodium community, he has a very niche like uh, content sites. He he tries to create um, an authority site, I guess you will, for certain products, maybe. It's robotics, like home robotics, like what, which one is the best little robot to clean your carpets, for instance. And he just goes through and gives tons of information on the specs and his experience and, you know, just all the feedback that he can get to, so that you, the consumer can make a better choice on which little vacuum robot you want to buy. And then you click through his website once you've made your decision and it takes you to Amazon and he makes a, an Amazon commission on that. It's just so amazing the type of value that people are willing to put out into the internet world for free with hopes that they can convert you to purchase something so that they can make a, a commission or, or something like that. It's uh, it's really awesome. You, and if you're listening to this, man, you know, you're definitely appreciated. I'll, I'll add your episode number to the show notes so people can listen to your episode Let's talk about the podcast, Chris. I know you've had a podcast for a while and it looks like you've started to become more active releasing podcasts. Did the podcast come before the community? Did the community come before the podcast or how did those two play into the growth and success of each other? Uh, the community, I would say came first. So in terms of progression, I would say it went like this is number one. 
um, in 2012, we decided we're going to do an event. And part of my reasoning for wanting to do an event, and when I say event, I mean an in-person sort of conference style event, um, I wanted to connect with other people. I was kind of uh, honestly a little isolated, you know, just sitting at my desk, no more employees, um, had, uh, had time and location freedom, but I didn't have like a tribe of people, a bunch of like-minded people that I could kind of talk shop and, uh, geek out about, so to speak <laughs> in regards to online business. And, um, so we decided to, we, we'd create an event 2012, did it. And, um, we got like 20 people to the event. Originally the idea was, Hey, we're going to teach people how to buy online businesses and, and build out portfolios and invest in them and that kind of thing. But what ended up happening as we listened to our market and what they told us was that it was more about the people that we got in the room. We we had a very high level, a very smart kind of entrepreneurial type of person in the room. And we created an environment where people were willing to share with each other and share their knowledge, share their experience with each other. And we, you know, I, I, I'm like, you know, we need to lead into this. We need to, we need to not just teach people what we know. We need to get smart people in a room and let them teach each other what they know. And the, the value that comes from that will be mm -hmm. significantly better than what we can do by ourselves. And so, uh, so that's kind of what we did as we, as we started through the next couple of years. And one of the things as we were listening to the community was that people, once they connected at our event in person, they didn't want to lose that connection. They wanted a, an avenue, a channel to be able to continue to stay connected over time. And given that we were all online entrepreneurs, it made a ton of sense that that channel could be online. So the simplest way to do it, and, and I could talk about my reasons why I chose this, but was to utilize Facebook. Um, so we created a Facebook group for everybody who was uh, basically attending the event or was interested in attending the event. And the cool thing about that is not only do people get to warm up with each other before the actual event, but they get to stay connected after the event. And I mentioned that Facebook and, you know, uh, there was a lot of kind of deciding and whether or not I would want to go on Facebook. I didn't want to put the community in a place that would be extremely distracting. But what I realized is that I wanted to be where people already were. Um, because I think the likelihood of them actually utilizing the community was significantly higher. And so that's one of the main reasons why I chose Facebook. If, if people are already on Facebook, they're more likely to actually utilize the community and it would be more valuable if they were to do that than say, require them to log into some other totally different website, right? Right. Yeah. It's the p push pull of building your community on someone else's pre-established platform where people are already hanging out and not owning that platform versus building your own platform, directing that traffic to your own website to create your community. But it's more, much more of an inconvenience for people to have another login, another place to check, to connect when they're already connecting. I, I struggle with that same thing with Liberty Virtual Assistants. Like, do I create my own website and try to get all these virtual assistants to come and, and, and engage and keep up with us on you know a Filipino website? Or do I just use uh, Facebook? And one little pro tip here, Chris, is uh, Filipinos on their cell phones, they actually get free data uh, for Facebook. So that was my deciding factor was they're already hanging out on Facebook and they're not charged by their cell phone carriers to visit Facebook and use Facebook messenger. So it was just a, uh, it was a really good platform for me to use just like it was like for it. you. Yeah. So once the Facebook community kind of got going and I, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, um, I want to have, I want to continue to provide value to the community, but at the same time, I want to get the word out a little bit more about Rhodium. I mean, I don't, I'm not like a crazy marketer or anything like that, but I was looking for a way where I could not only contribute to the community, but also potentially get people who don't know about Rhodium to know more about it. And so that's why I'm like, okay, well, um, I started looking at my, my skill set. Honestly, took a hard look at, at myself and there was sort of like three avenues that I could have taken. Number one would have been writing, meaning like writing blog posts and, and uh, doing that kind of thing. Two would have been video, like YouTube channel, et cetera. And three was uh, podcast and which is audio. And I looked at first, I looked at writing. I'm like, you know, uh, writing is one of those skills that 
I have the ideas in my head, but oftentimes to translate those onto quote unquote paper or, you know, utilize my keyboard or whatever, it, it feels like work to me. So I wasn't excited about that. And then I looked at video and I'm just the kind of person who I don't feel like, a, and this is a limiting belief, but I don't feel like I'm a big personality kind of person that I could bring the level of energy that's required to be on video all day, you know, every day or whatever. Right. And then I looked at podcasts and there's a couple sure. avenues you can go with that. You can do more of an interview style or you can do more of a, you know, sort of solo episode where it's just you talking and um, was not stoked about the solo episode kind of for the same reason uh, w in relation to writing. But what I loved about the interview format was that not only could I get the word out about Rhodium, but I, I could also highlight people in my community. And I'm actually a big believer that I'd rather shine the light on people who are kind of up and coming, who nobody has heard about, than to shine the light on mm. a person that everybody has heard about, that they've seen their TEDx talk and or their TED talk, and, or they've seen them on stage or whatever. I'm more excited about kind of those hidden gems again, like, like that theme that I've talked about, um, and shining a light on them. So it gave me a platform to really utilize my skill set just in terms of like curiosity, seeing connections, et cetera, in that interview format where I didn't have to be in the spotlight, but I could put it on who I chose. And I chose primarily people who are involved in the Rhodium community. Yeah. That's the great thing about having a, a podcast where you do interviews is I never really want the spotlight to be on me. That's why I get so many cool people like you who are accomplished and have a lot of experience and wisdom to come on my show. So I can be like, Hey, now let's learn about building a digital community with Chris Yates. Right. <laughs> right. And I can kind of stay, stay in the background a little bit and just be, like you said, be really curious, ask you questions, pull out your amazing story and the amazing story of all my guests. And I'm just the one kind of here asking questions and facilitating. So I definitely feel you on that. What well, I know that the Rhodium Weekend community and conference is an invite only conference and it's, it's pretty small, especially compared to some of the other conferences that I've been to, which are a thousand, 2000, 3000 people. You try to limit the Rhodium conference to right around a hundred people. What's the point of that? And what type of person are you looking for that you feel makes a good fit within your community? Yeah. Well, number one is that people want to be around people like them. So that is human nature. Two is that I believe that people have two ways to learn. They can either learn by doing and making the mistakes themselves, or they can find somebody who's already done what they want to do and then learn from them and take action and avoid the same mistakes that they make. And I think that the latter, like learning from other people with experience is a way more efficient and way more proven way to achieve whatever goal you want to achieve. So it's really important that when I do, you know, bring or invite people to the community, that not only can they get value from other people's experience at the event, but also that they can give value in, in that case. So that when, if everybody can give and receive, then kind of everybody benefits in that case. But what you see at some of the larger events where they don't control and curate like I do is you can get people from all over the spectrum. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that puts the focus typically on the stage rather than the attendees themselves. So it's all about who's the biggest speaker. Uh, what's, what's this famous guy that I can take a picture with and post on Facebook or whatever that's coming to the event, you know? And right. for me, I'm not as excited or impressed about that. I'm more about like, let's get smart people together and let's have a highly curated environment where people can come together, learn from each other. And yeah, people can do talks and stuff, but that's not what it's all about. It's about the community. So that was kind of my philosophy, I guess, from a high level in terms of why I made the decision to make it more curated and um, and to keep it more intimate. Because the other thing is that, you know, you, there's this there's this concept of um, Dunbar's number, which is essentially that that humans have a cognitive limit of the number of connections of relate or in other words relationships that they can maintain in their in their mind or you know in in their everyday life. And that number is they found scientifically speaking to be around 150. Now not everybody's exactly 150, but let's just call it 150. So obviously we have you know let's just call it. 10 to 20 people who are maybe in our inner circle. This might be family, et cetera. Um, and then you've got kind of got that extended circle. So my idea was if I could keep this community below 150, there might actually be 
an idea where kind of everybody can understand everybody else in their relationship with each other within that community, and it would become extremely tight knit and stronger, etc. So that was kind of like another piece of the puzzle. Right. And I can, you know, from my experience, there is definitely a community. This is a community. You call it the Rhodium community for a reason. Unlike some of the larger conferences I've been to, which is more like a, a gathering of people and there's like little sects or little communities within these larger uh, events, you know, your community is very engaged. And this is something that I am constantly impressed with. You know, my, my idea is I want to be in only a few communities, but be engaged and active in those communities. And the Rhodium weekend Facebook group is one of the most active and helpful and valuable communities that I'm a part of Chris. And I just want to thank you again for inviting me on board. Even whenever I wasn't a proven entrepreneur, you took a, a gamble on me and I, I really appreciate that. You mentioned something about value and making sure that everyone in the community can contribute value. And whenever I came away from the conference last October in Vegas, there was so much value there. I mean, from the speakers, from the networking, you make an active, you purposefully give us networking time between the presentations, which I think is just as valuable as the presentations themselves. But there was two things that I really came away with, and you made sure to say these things several times, these phrases. The first one was lead with value, always lead with value. And the second one was always speak from experience. What do those two mean? How did you come up with those? And why are they, why do you think I walked away remembering those two things specifically as the most valuable aspects of your event? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the lead with value piece. Let me put it this way. <laughs> this is always the simplest uh, metaphor or analogy. Um, if you think about dating, so let's say that you see a uh, beautiful woman or man across the room that you're you're really interested in meeting and 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 stuff is the first thing you're going to do walk over to them and say hey will you come home with me and you know do whatever right typically uh i don't think it's so, so weird that people in business immediately do that and and you see it all the time in not only online communities but you know you you can think about um, the worst networking event you've ever been to where somebody literally comes up and they start by pitching you. It's kind of like the same thing. It's like going right. straight for the, the bedroom, right? The bedroom ask maybe, and, and the challenge is <laughs> one out of a hundred it'll work, but, uh, for 99 other ones, they're sure. going to slap you in the face. Right. So, um, but, um, it, it's part of it is like, I wanted to develop a culture in our community that people were not coming in, well actually here let me put it this way so there's there's a fantastic book that explains this way better than I can called give and take by a guy named Adam Grant and the idea is that people generally fall into a few different um, kind of buckets one is they're either givers two is that they might be a matcher and three is that they might be a taker so a taker is kind of that person who just immediately tries to take you to bed right um they're just like they, it's all in it for him was what can you do for me and they will take 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 without feeling any level of guilt or um giving back in any way two are the matchers so the matchers are the kind of people who are like well i, I will help you with your problem if you'll pay me or if you'll do this favor for me, or they'll always hold this thing you did with them over your head and, you know, be waiting for that moment when they can call in that favor. So, so they won't give freely. They expect something in return. Right. And then there are the mm -hmm. givers who literally will just give um, without any expectation of reciprocity. So what I wanted to do is build a, and if you look at how this maps out, if you were to say take 150 people and you filled a room with givers versus matchers versus um, takers or some combination of those, the, the best <laughs> setup is actually to have a room full of givers because what ends up happening is that if everybody is giving, everybody ends up getting um, it's just kind of how it all ends up working. And I know this sounds maybe a little bit, I don't, I don't want it to sound like, you know, this is like a woo woo thing or whatever. Like it, it literally is like, if somebody has a problem, there's like 10 people in the community that are just ready to help them and solve that problem. You know, one year later, that same person who helped that person 
may come back with a with his own problem and that other person may be able to help him but there's no expectation that they're going to get something for helping helping them because they know it will kind of come back to them eventually so hopefully that kind of paints the picture a little bit on that first piece does that make sense yeah for sure and i've experienced this firsthand and even in my own life since i came to this perspective thanks to you and the rhodium community like i'm constantly trying to lead with value first like i'm even hesitant to go into the rhodium facebook group and like ask a question without trying to offer something at the same time so it i, I do have an instinct now to like if somebody's there and they have a question like if i know it and it's not going to take too long like if i'm in a busy work day or something but i can spend three, four, five minutes helping someone out. I mean, man, think about what they would do for me right in the future without me even having to ask. They just want, it builds that camaraderie between people that like, man, Chris is such a great guy because I've had three questions and he was able to answer two of them within like an hour of me posting this in, in the, in the Facebook group. Like I, I can't wait to help that guy. Right. That's, that's the, that's the environment that I think that this perspective builds is like, I can't like, like Devani, who is a member of this community and also a client at Liberty Virtual Assistance, like I, I can't wait until she has some questions that maybe maybe I have knowledge about that I can just help her out a little bit. It doesn't take it doesn't take anything away from me, but it gives and creates value for other people, and I, I really appreciate that. So, what about the speak from experience versus, I guess, speaking from theory? Yeah, um, I wanted to make one quick point, and I'll come back to that. So, one thing that I would say. If for those who are listening, who are considering building a community, or even they have a work environment where they see these different personalities, my opinion is you got to get the takers out as quickly as possible because they can be like a cancer. And what ends up happening is, you know, this culture gets so ingrained that the takers just if, if somebody comes in and they immediately are a taker, they stand out like a sore thumb and they just, they end up getting weeded out of the community really, really quickly. Like I'm basically like, I'll give somebody a warning once. And, and actually normally takers don't even get into the community because all have already curated them out. But every once in a while, somebody mm -hmm. slips through or doesn't really understand the, you know, the details and the finer nuances of, of what to do and not to do. But, um, but you got to get them out as quickly as possible because what ends up happening is as soon as people start feeling like a community has a bunch of takers, or in other words, they start seeing that there's a ton of spam happening in the community, everybody's going to leave. Like that's just the reality. So not only are you hurting the community, you're also hurting me as the founder of this group to, you know, my ability to run an actual successful business. So I, I take it very, very seriously that when, when takers come into the group, I get them out really, really quickly. So, and then the, the, in terms of speaking from experience. So I think the simplest way I could explain this would be that have you ever had somebody give you advice and they, they talk to you like this, you know what you need to do dot, 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 or. Right. And they use the yes. word should, you should, you do, should this. do this. And they, and they, they they give you a very prescriptive thing, right? What immediately happens to you typically when, when somebody approaches you that way? Don't tell me what to yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> it's defensive mode immediately. Right. Yeah, yeah, now, exactly. have you ever met with like a really interesting person who has a ton of experience in life and you have this challenge and, and you, you kind of present it to them and they just sort of sat back, thought about it for a second. And they're like, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you know, I had a similar experience in my life where X, Y, Z happened. And here's how I handled that. Now, in that case, what would your response be? Yeah. I'm interested. Like, okay, well tell me more. Like maybe I could learn from your yeah. experience. Do you, so your uh, defensive wall did not flag immediately. Right. So no, it turns into curiosity yes. instead. And then think about it from this perspective, you're sitting in a group and part of what we do at Rhodium Weekend is we do round tables. So we break up into small groups, but if you're sitting in a group of six people, let's say, and uh, one person has a challenge, let's say person A has a challenge, person B has a solution for them. Person B starts doing the should and here's what you need to do this you got to do this this is um like uh in theory this should work right like etc should you know all that kind of stuff like future based words mm -hmm. then what ends up happening is the conversation between b and a number one doesn't go well but everybody else in the group immediately shuts off their brain because they think it's not relevant to them because it's so specific mm -hmm. and prescriptive to person a 
But if you're sitting in a group of six people, person B starts sharing his or her experience of uh, a particular, how they overcame a particular challenge, it may not relate exactly to the problem that the other people in the group besides person A have, but they can listen to that and apply it and sort of have this this narrative happening in their mind as that person's talking about their experience of, oh yeah, that might apply for this other problem that I have. And so everybody in the community gets benefit from it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it just reminds me of how different this is than like public school where we're just taught, should, you should do this. You have to do this. You've got to do this. You must learn this instead of it being more of an experienced based uh, recommendation type of educational system, may, may like uh, the Praxis or a mentoring or internships are, I, I can just relate to that. I can remember being back in public school and just being like, this teacher doesn't know what they're talking about, but they're like just spitting this stuff at me and telling me all this crap that I should learn. Like who, uh, who are they to tell me? Right. It, but it was the very opposite effect when we're at those round tables, because who knows what experience is going to come out of somebody's mouth that may be relevant to me and I can learn from. And when people are speaking from experience, then I can't tell them they're wrong because that's their experience right now. Either I can listen to their experience or I can ignore their experience, but their experience is their mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. And, and I get so tired of theory in, in advice. And uh, like at the end of the day, I want to know, has it worked? Is this proven? Um, what kind of results did you get? Because I'm going to go spend, if I'm going to take somebody's advice and I'm going to go spend either money or time and waste it on what they think might work, they're not only hurting their own reputation, but they're hurting me as a business owner. So that's another part of it is just like, I believe that experience is, trumps theory, um, especially in business all day long. Yeah. And that's why I really focus on entrepreneurship is because I've been through the theory of the freedom movement, the constitution, Austrian economics, all of this min minimal government stuff. And none of it really created more freedom for me. It wasn't until I started acting that I truly started feeling free. And that segues us really nicely into the freedom segment. Chris, sure. are you ready? How has becoming a digital entrepreneur provided more freedom in your own personal life? Yeah. I mean, I think the best example, not everybody listening to this probably has children, but you may one day want to have children. But as a father, so I have two kids, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, both boys. I'm able to take my kid to the bus stop every day if he, if, you know, if he wants me to go. Um, I'm able to um, actually it moved into a home office now. So my kids have access to me anytime during the day that they're home. They can just walk in and talk to me. I can sit and show. I actually put one of my kids on one of my podcasts just for fun. I mean, like I can involve them and, and blur the line between work life and home life a little bit and have the flexibility to, you know, take off on a Thursday to go to uh, the lake and hang out with the family for the weekend. Um, I don't have to answer to anybody <laughs> in order to do that. Um, I have the flexibility in uh, June. It's looking like I'm going to take a three week road trip and visit 11 cities across the West coast of the U S to, uh, to meet entrepreneurs along the way. And I'm going to take the family with me, you know, and, and just have an amazing experience and hit like Yosemite and the grand Canyon and, and that kind of thing. And so I, I, for me, it's, it's sort of like having control to enough control over my life to where I can choose, uh, where to put my focus at any given time. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Isn't it? The, the freedom associated with building your own business being responsible for your own life, getting that cash flow in to support your lifestyle. We're really pushing the envelope of what it means to, to be mobile and, and free of our own lives these days. Unlike any other time in history, we haven't been able to build these types of digital businesses where we're geographically independent if we so choose. You know, Chris, it's a, I would say being able to spend time with, with children and your family is one of the main answers, one of the most common answers that I get with this question. I, I, you know, it's just wonderful that you've built a business and a lifestyle where you get to choose to hang out with your family and go on an awesome three week trip on the, on the West coast. It's amazing. Before we go to the next segment here, I also want to add this and, and this is kind of eating my own dog food a little bit, but oftentimes people when they when people ask them this kind of question sometimes they, it immediately is an answer that relates to what 
kind of this freedom lifestyle or whatever does for them as an individual. But I want to just add that it's not only about me and my freedom with my kids and all that kind of stuff. It's also about the freedom that I'm creating in other people's lives. I mean, through Rhodium, I've had several people quit their jobs. I mean, obviously now you're maybe an example. I don't, I, I don't take credit for what you're doing, Ash, but I, yeah, that's but I, uh, I certainly like feel like if I was a small part, the way that I think about it is like people who come to my event, they're like spaceships or asteroids or something out in space. And coming to Rhodium was sort of like this little pebble that bumped them that maybe it's not a big change in the short mm. term, but the trajectory of their life was potentially significantly altered just because of that little bump that over the long haul, a whole new life that maybe they didn't even imagine could happen, right? So I've had like $10 million and more, more of online businesses that have bought, sold, been partnered in, invested in through Rhodium. I've had people quit their jobs. I've had people sell their company and start something totally different that's more fulfilling. I mean, at the end of the day, like... Yes, that's still about me because it feels really good, but it's also about the community that I'm helping and supporting. And that's really where I'm like stoked about that. I'm really excited about that, that sort of passion and purpose that comes from helping these people create freedom in their lives. It's amazing the, the freedom that's created in your own life when you're helping other people become it free, is, isn't yeah. it? It's there's so much passion behind that and, and so much appreciation. Uh, yeah, I, I will say thank you right now on air, Chris Yates, for helping me form a better idea in my head about where I wanted to direct and focus my life and the value that I wanted to produce in society and giving me the confidence and, and the network and the connections, you know, four of some of my earliest clients at Liberty virtual assistance came from the rhodium community, but I never advertised. I never had, I never did anything. I never tried to reach out to people and cold call people or message people. It was just all word of mouth and it's all a reputation system. And I was that little pebble and, you know, I got knocked off my track just a little bit to where my trajectory changed and now i can see like it the trajectory is much different than it was you know six months ago or so whenever i was at the rodeo weekend conference and it was just such a a great influence on my life chris so thank you very yeah, much you're welcome I, I'm, I'm you know again i'm really do feel grateful that i was able to to help in any small way the other thing that i would say just for the benefit of our, our audience what ash just did is actually something that all of you can do for people who have made an impact in your life. And it turns out that Ash is probably going to feel really good about this for the next probably, um, I'd say, 30 days or so. And th they've scientifically looked at this idea of sitting down and saying thank you to somebody who's positively impacted your life. That's actually one of the best things you can do for happiness at, for an extended period of time. This this little high that Ash might get for the next month or so um, will last for a period of time just because of the fact that he just, you know, sort of thanks somebody who affected his life positively. So I'd encourage everybody listening to think of one person in your life, go back as far as you need to, might've been a teacher or something like that, or a coach or whatever, and just call them up or send them an email or something and just say, say thank you, similar to what Ash just did. Yes. Yeah, showing appreciation is so important, Chris. Great advice. If anyone from my audience would like to get in touch with you, or maybe someone out there thinks that they would be a good fit for the Rhodium community, how can they contact you? Uh, they can go to chrisyates.org, and you can pretty much find all my info on there. Um, if you want to find out about Rhodium Weekend, it's R-H-O-D-I-U-M weekend.com. And it turns out that if you apply to Rhodium Weekend, you'll end up scheduling a 15 minute call with me um, because I actually do an interview with everybody who's interested in attending. So if you are interested in uh, even just connecting with me, feel free to apply even if you don't plan to attend because you'll end up getting on a call with me. And I have to ask Chris, what is Rhodium and why did you pick the name Rhodium for your <laughs> Yeah. Career? Um so you remember how I said we we did the original event in 2012. Um we got about 20 people there. Mm -hmm. The original event was called Internet Investment Summit. So Summit in my mind is like I don't know, thousands of people or something like that. So to have a 20 person summit so, sort of felt a little bit silly. Um, and originally it was all about people buying and selling online businesses. And after a couple of years, I realized how much more this community and this event is than just the buying and selling. I mean, really the buying is a 
slice, a tiny slice of the overall ownership of online businesses. And so I wanted the ability and the flexibility to have a brand that could mean more than just investing um, in online businesses. And it has become significantly more than that over the years. It's it's about people who think like investors. It's about people who understand that you can build an online business that can be automated or semi-automated or semi-passive or whatever you want to call it and have a fulfilling, fun thing that you can do. And, and you can own multiple. You don't just have to own one and you don't have to be the next Facebook to, to live a good life. So, so that's kind of uh, the, the flexibility. Now, rhodium is actually a, uh, a metal. It, at the time, is one of the most expensive precious, precious metals um, on the planet. And so we were looking for something better than bronze, silver, gold um, to, to call it. And so we're like, well, rhodium is better than platinum. Let's call it rhodium. So that's what we went with. That's awesome. High value. Chris Yates, thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. Uh, you're definitely appreciated. Keep building freedom. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before uh, we head out? No, I think this has been a fantastic interview. And, and I just, I hope that, I think at the end of the day, nobody can give you <laughs> um, the specific prescription or advice. But if you listen to people's experiences, um, I think that is the right path. Not only that, though, you have to actually start taking those steps, start start doing something. So think about what is one thing you can do based on today's call that, uh, that would be simple. It might be calling up somebody and saying thank you, or it might be going over and, and looking at a few online businesses for sale or something that you can do to get one more step further based on my experiences that I've shared here. Just real quick, is there one website that you would recommend people go and start looking at websites that are for actually, sale? Actually, yeah, Centurica, my my company I mentioned, we we actually aggregate a lot of the online businesses for sale. Um, so if you go to Centurica.com, that's C-E-N-T-U-R-I-C-A.com, and then you click on, um, uh, I think it's Internet Businesses for Sale. On there, you can, you can basically see a lot of the um, online businesses that are currently on the market in one place. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate your time today. No worries. Thank you, Ash, for having me on. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to episode 68, Website Investing and the Rhodium Community with Chris Yates. I really hope that you found value in this one. If you can't tell, Chris is an absolute pro and everyone in his community is. And I'm just so thankful to be a part of the Rhodium Weekend and the Rhodium Community. Also, if you're interested in virtual assistants or you just want to chat with me about how a virtual assistant could plug in to your business so that you can delegate away some of those daily or weekly tasks, open yourself back up and regain that freedom to continue to build. Feel free to contact me, ash at libertyentrepreneurs.com or apply at libertyvas.com. You can head on over to the website libertyvas.com and download our top 27 tasks to delegate to a virtual assistant. I'll see everyone again in two weeks. And until then, keep building freedom.